I am Louise Planker. And I'm Fritz Coleman. We are Media Path, and I am thrilled to disclose that my personal Media Path began with today's guest. When we were kids, we had those treasured family records that belonged to the household, Burl Ives, Peter, Paul, and Mary, Broadway cast albums, the Mills Brothers, and then for me, one birthday, my own little record player and Herman's Hermits. Yes, Peter Noon is about to join us, but first, Fritz and I are going to share a bit about what we have been enjoying this week. Fritz, what do you got? Okay, I got a good movie I like. Mm. Uh, it's uh, streaming on Amazon Prime. It's The Tender Bar. Yeah. Based on a true story. In 2005, J.R. Mobringer published a memoir entitled The Tender Bar, a memoir. Mobringer is a novelist and a journalist, and this is the story of his life. It's set in 1972. A nine-year-old J.R. is being raised by a single mother, and they move into the rundown house of his grandfather on Long Island. The young boy is searching for a father figure and comes under the spell of his charismatic uncle Charlie, who is a bartender at a local bar called Dickens. Now, the bar is called Dickens because Uncle Charlie is a self-educated man who got that way by being a voracious reader. Uncle Charlie teaches J.R. about the great writers, and Charlie and other hangers-on in the bar are the Greek chorus that kind of raised this kid. They dispense practical, everyday wisdom to the boy. They teach him, quote, the mechanics of manhood, end quote, both the good and the bad. They take him to baseball games. They teach him anything that's possible. This environment is where J.R. decides he wants to become a writer. His mother literally wills him into Yale University. Ben Affleck is Uncle Charlie. Ty Sheridan is the young J.R. Lily Rabe is his mother. It's directed and produced by George Clooney. Affleck got a Golden Globe and a Screen Actors Guild nomination for his acting. I think it's a warm and touching story. I really liked it, and I really connected with Ben's character, Uncle Charlie. The topic of alcoholism is broached in the movie, but not dwelled on like it apparently is in the book, where it becomes a core issue, revealing that J.R. had to quit drinking at 25 years old, he had a real problem. You know, being brought up in a bar might have had something to do with that. J.R. Mobringer won a Pulitzer Prize for one of his magazine pieces. I, 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 I was very moved by this movie. I loved it. And apparently growing up at a bar can turn a young boy with straight black hair into a young man with curly blonde hair. See how that works? So it's there's something in the chemistry Alcohol there. Alcohol messes up the no, genetics. No, it's the, the actors are fantastic. It's great. It's it's warm. And and. I, I love a piece that, that shows human warmth because there's just enough cruelty depicted on TV. Oh, yeah. And so this is a special He was a piece. great yeah. uncle. God, I wanted him as an uncle so bad. Yeah, Ben Affleck is awesome. So I, I've been watching Made on Netflix. I haven't seen it. Yeah, so it's a series. I have been very much enjoying uh, this show. A young mother named Alex, outstandingly played by Margaret Qualley, leaves an abusive relationship with zero money and one toddler. She turns to housekeeping to scratch and claw her way beyond homelessness and despair and to provide a safe life for herself and her child. Made is a limited series created for Netflix by Molly Smith Metzler. It's inspired by Stephanie Land's memoir, Made, Hard Work, Low Pay, and a Mother's Will to Survive. Alex's high wire heroic resilience is especially precarious and impressive in light of the absence of any parental safety net. Her family is impossibly turbulent with a violent father who is busy raising dysfunctional family number two and a nutty, hippie, untreated bipolar mother delightfully played by Margaret Qualley's real-life mom, Andy McDowell. Maid accurately depicts how agonizingly difficult it is to extricate yourself from an abusive relationship. Abusers either know exactly which emotional buttons to press, or they will often versatilely hit every note on the piano. Outrage, shame, guilt, hysteria, threats, pleas, affection, anguish, fear, help, passion, to find the one that will get you to turn that car around. When you have a little kid together, those tactics are exponentially more powerful. The writing is crisp and smart and funny and full of timely wisdom, such as Alex's mother Paula proclaiming, I am in nature, in our ancestry, in the ferocious lineage of warrior women that have banged on the drum of life as a collective. How old is the kid that says that? No, that's the mom. Oh, okay. 
<laughs> that the kid. That would be really cool if a two-year-old said that. I'd be like, wait, hold up. Stop the train. So, yeah, that's the kind of writing you'll find. It's just really delicious. Lots of quotable stuff and good wisdom. Sounds wonderful. Good and it just shows you how difficult it is once you, you know, it's like sort of like show this to any girl who's having sex maybe too young, you know, because sex makes babies. And then once you have a child, it's just that much more difficult to fulfill your own own dreams. I think, you know, we should have learned how to sustain our own adult lives before we start to raise one. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe that's the... Good point. Are you ready to welcome our guest? I can't wait. Yeah, I'm excited. Peter Blair Dennis Bernard Noon has a lot of names and talents. He is an entertainer who has been delighting audiences nearly all of his life. Peter Noon was a child actor on British TV who at the age of 15 rose to international fame as Herman in the pop band Herman's Hermits, scoring hit after hit with... I'm into something good. Mrs. Brown, you've got a lovely daughter. Silhouettes. I'm Henry VIII. I am. Wonderful world. There's a kind of hush. And the list goes on and on to the point of selling more than 60 million records and achieving seven gold records. Peter Noon has starred on Broadway in The Pirates of Penzance. He's enjoyed a recurring role as Paddington on the CBS daytime drama As the World Turns. And his loyal fans, known collectively as Nunatics, will attest that he is the most <laughs> handsome and charming man to ever guest star on this podcast. Please welcome Peter Noon. Yeah. Thanks for having me. It's wonderful. <laughs> so is it an honor for you for you to learn that you are, well, I'm sure in, is the case with so many people, for you to learn that you are their first record in their record collection? That's, you know, I remember the first record I got in my record collection. So that's kind of a big deal, I think, to be the first record in somebody's collection. Mine was, on, mine was Danny and the Juniors at the Hop. There you go. Oh, yeah. Uh, which is, I can't imagine what, what was the attraction. My sister had all those Elvis Presley records and Buddy Holly records. Uh, Pete, you were brought up in Manchester. Of, you know, my first record, yeah, Manchester. I, my parents lived in Liverpool, but my sister and I, my parents went to university and my sister and I had to live with my grandparents, which was great because you could, you could, you know, grandparents got fall asleep at nine o'clock and they're dead. <laughs> Good and they're always dead. <laughs> And uh, we, you could have any kind of, you could set the drum kit up in their living room and they would never know. So talk about that environment and, and where you got your first nibbles of a music passion. You know, my first nibbles, uh, Fritz, was it was, it, was, it, it, every, it was all encompassing. Everybody in my family played a musical instrument or sang. You know, grandparents, uncles, like, example, if somebody, if for a christening, a funeral, a baptism, a <laughs> wedding, everything, everybody would congregate in a room called the parlor. And my dad played the trombone. My uncle Lawrence played the trumpet. My auntie Mary played the piano. My grandfather was the church organ player, organist, I think you called it. And my, my grandmother was the choir mistress at St. Saint Monica's Church in Manchester, in this little village we lived in. And it was all music in those days was everywhere. You know, you went in the kitchen and there was one there was one radio station in England, remember, only one, the BBC, and whatever they played, everybody in the world, everybody in our music world heard the same songs. Mm. So we grew up with, you know, I heard Ink Spots and Mills Brothers and stuff. I heard you mention that, the Mills Brothers. Mm. I, I know I... When I was about 16, I, I, was, I was friends with the editor of the Daily Mirror, and I'd go to his house, and he was like in shock that I knew all this music because my family played music. You know, my grandfather bought the sheet music. If we liked a song like Fats Waller, he would go and buy the sheet music. We didn't have a way to buy a record. They didn't have a record player. So, so we learned created. at the beginning what was on the radio if we liked something, we would go and buy the sheet music and we'd learn to play it. And so, so there must have been something about the BBC or Radio One or whatever they called it in those days because it was the seed that allowed all the great British rock guys like the Stones and Led Zeppelin to introduce American children to their own art form, which was blues. <laughs> and you must have been hearing it somewhere in England. All, all music in England was created, all popular music at the time was American. 
all the Broadway show. Think about it. it. Once upon a time, everything came from America in the entertainment business. All the movies came. We had those cute little English ones in black and white that we loved. And, the, and the, in America, you had the Alex North kind of soundtrack movies. And But most of it, like all the sound of music, everything came from America. Elvis Presley, Frank Sinatra, everything before them, Nat King Cole, Ella Fitzgerald, everything, for everything that English people grew up with. Was um, was Americana? But then you All took the recipe and added your own ingredients and sent it back over to us. Mm-hmm. Well, the only added ingredient was, I think, enthusiasm. What happened <laughs> is, really, I think what happened is very quite like the fifties now in America, that people are kind of not they're kind of not that energetic. They're not coming up and saying, "Hey, I got a new record." There's none of that going. Hey, man, we got a record. <laughs> so we were very enthusiastic, and you know that was why we were called that's where the word enthusiast comes from mm. and all those people like the the reason the stones had all those blues records because they found a niche to become enthusiasts some people went train spotting and collected car numbers mm-hmm. and, and but and some people collected stamps some people collected girlfriends we collected <laughs> body holly and the crickets and the everly brothers and roy orbison and no english people in there there's well, no you talk- English people in my record. Yeah, I mean, and that's even like you said you named your band after something that you thought was American because you lo- you loved everything American. But what I'm wondering is like you're saying that there was music, everyone in your household, everyone on your block had an instrument. But Everybody did people did. recognize something remarkable in your talent at, at a young age? Yeah, well, you know, I was a persistent little shit. <laughs> <laughs> And, you know, the pushy little guy, Every, all your friends at school hate the pushy guy. You know what I mean? Like, like I once heard somebody say, you know, I, I was 16 before I realized I'd been able to play the piano accordion and tap dance at the same time wasn't going to get me a lot of girlfriends. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, you know, I was really into it. You know, I took a record player to school and at lunchtime we would play records in the schoolyard. And at nighttime we found Manchester is a pretty dismal place we found un- an underground uh, passageway that you could go in and you could play a little record player with a battery with the, you take the lid off and, yeah. and and play music and we created a kind of scene and, and <laughs> I, should, I shouldn't really say this but the world seemed and was incredibly safe for young people mm-hmm. our parents could let us be independent and do whatever we want because nothing bad ever happened in our neighborhood. You know, well, I, remember I think one... everything bad had happened. They they had saved. Yeah, the... you know, I mean, no, I mean, no, they I had think... saved the world and they had won the war and they felt like, let's have some kids and live. <laughs> yeah, you know, but independent. They gave us independence. Like, for example, my sister and I in mm-hmm. summer, we'd, we'd cycle 60 miles. Our parents would say goodbye to us in June. And we would cycle <laughs> to my grandmother's uh, and we would go home in September f- to go back to school. Wow. And they'd get a postcard, you know, a fun postcard, rain, terrible weather, wish you were here kind of thing. That was the only contact. We, my grandmother didn't have a phone. She lived in Wales. She had no phone, no running water, no electricity, no gas, no services. Wow. And, you know, my sister and I would go to the world. We didn't think anything of it. But we were safe. Mm-hmm. We could wander around on the beach and there were no weirdos. And, and any weirdos that came anywhere near us, my grandmother would beat them up. They would be beaten up. And they were <laughs> once, once some big kid hit me and she went round to his house and she held the father and made me kick him in the ghoulie. She said, <laughs> Oh my goodness, wow. that's a problem solver. You know, <laughs> we were totally safe, and and the idea, that idea, and, and during the music scene, you could go to the cavern. Like, when you were 13, your sister could get you into the cavern in Liverpool. There was no alcohol. Mm-hmm. There was a sense that there may be drugs, but there was a big guy at the door who wore a tuxedo, who was an ex-wrestler, <laughs> who saw trouble before it got into the club. It's before the police got involved in managing clubs and everything. So these people knew who the trouble was. So they never got all the fighting took place outside the club Mm -hmm. and all the kids inside. There was no alcohol. Everybody danced. The girls were on one side. The boys were on one side. And everybody was safe. And then it all grew into this fantastic scene for young people that 
the idea that we could go out at night and be home by nine o'clock and have and have been see the cavern had a thing called Fritz. The cavern had a thing called the Junior Cavern. So they had there's three different gigs you could get there. And like I said, I was very persistent. So <laughs> you could do the lunchtime session, which was a lot of girls, teenage girls would go to the cavern for lunch and and jive. They would do this <laughs> sort of jive thing on their own with other girls. You know, jive, like now probably country and western. <laughs> kick boot dancing whatever it's called but they would do this jive thing and then have a sandwich and a cup of tea and then go back to work and then there was the junior cavern because the government had decided that they would support music not as an art form as a way of keeping kids between everybody's mum and dad worked mm. so kids from four o'clock when they finished school until 6 30 ish were in this danger zone so there were all these Youth clubs Activities. and the cavern was one of them. So, yeah. so Herman's Hermits or whatever we were called at the time, I think we were called Pete Novak and the Heartbeats. Uh, the guy who booked the cavern called Bob Wooler, and he liked us. He, he didn't like our music at all, but he liked us. And uh, so we do the lunchtime cavern, and he'd say, "Stick around, uh, stick around for the junior cavern if you want." <laughs> If you want. And we'd say, oh, we'd love to. And bit by bit, we weaseled our way just by being there all the time into playing there three times a day, which is kind of like the Beatles at the Star Club right. in Hamburg. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. We got to play a lot. And we realized really, I look at the date sheets because, you know, it's interesting to look at your the beginning. And uh, we, we we worked every every day almost. If if we didn't have a gig, we'd play somewhere for free, like my sister's hairdresser's birthday party or something. You know, there, we were just a really busy, busy, hardworking guy band, and and because of that, our our turn came quicker than mm. than it should have probably because. What happened was every band in Liverpool and Manchester had been signed to a label, mm -hmm. except for Herman and the Hermits. And so it was our turn. It was like Seattle with Nirvana and all those bands that came out. So, so now it was our turn. And there just wasn't anybody between us and the record deal because it was our turn. But we were only 15. Yeah. So they were the first professional band that you were a part of. Usually the story is that, you know, like the, all the Beatles were members of two or three bands before the Beatles formed. But this was your first professional experience with these guys. Not really. No, I, I it might have sounded like that when I tried to take credit. But um, <laughs> there was a band. First of all, we had a band and my grandmother was in it, which was not good because she had a washboard. <laughs> She had a pretty good groove. She was pretty musically inclined. So she was the percussionist. And we'd do American songs that were made famous in England by a guy called Lonnie Donegan. Yeah, Kimberling, yeah, from a, yeah. 50 miles from a Kimberling, yeah. <laughs> and I, could pretty, I could do a pretty good kind of country and Western accent. So I was the lead singer in that band. And then there was a band called The Cyclones, and, and we played instrumental music. And one day... <laughs> We were learning this song. It was called, I think it was called Apache or something. FBI down, da down, da down, da down. And one of the guys in the band said, "You know what, Peter? You're not, you're never going to get this, are you?" I said, "Well, I'm, I'm going to keep trying." And he goes, "Maybe you should be the lead singer." <laughs> oh, that's funny. See, that's around when everyone's voice Stop is changing. Stop playing the guitar and be a singer. But so, right there, everyone's voice is changing, and you don't know where everyone's going to land. And probably well, as soon as I, was, I was landed on my boy lollipop all the time. <laughs> <laughs> now, where, where would you go to work out the good. harmonies? Because that's one thing I noticed about your records is you guys had pretty tight harmonies. Well, you know, everybody in those days lived in one room or a van. Mm -hmm. Mo most of us lived in a van. Like I know the Beatles for a long time lived in a thing called a van, and we did. And in the van, we would practice other people's songs. Remember, we didn't have our own songs, and neither did the Beatles at the beginning. So we would learn the Everly Brothers songs, and you'd copy each other's part. No, I'm going to sing the Phil part, and you sing the Don part. <laughs> and, and we'd slowly switch each other's parts. You know, your voice is better on the Don part part here mm -hmm. and that and so we 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 loved that that was part of the deal i mean if you think of those bands at the time they weren't like the hollies were originally an every everly brothers cover band they just did everly brothers songs we tried to do everly brothers songs but we were more drawn to romantic buddy holly and the crickets and uh 
and my boy lollipop and uh <laughs> And um, um, while we while we were growing up and and practicing and living, uh, and our, a day in the life of Herman's Hermits or Herman and the Hermits before we changed our name would be that we would get up in the morning and we'd go to a rehearsal place, and it was Steve Titterington's house, mm. and uh, and his sister was a police officer, so we could make as much noise as we want. We never got. <laughs> And it's really, really, it was an amazing situation because we could practice for 10 hours. And people must have been complaining, but they couldn't do much about it because we had a cop in the family kind of thing. <laughs> so we rehearsed a lot and we would rehearse one song all day. And that night we would find somewhere to go and play it, like oh. Collingwood Youth Club or, or, you know, little youth clubs all around. Remember, there's 800 bands in my street by now. Right. But we were always pushing into little situations. And we would play the song, and if it didn't go down well, we'd drop it, and the next day we'd find another song. Mm -hmm. I remember we did Ebb Tide, and it didn't work out. <laughs> <laughs> and and, and <laughs> who were the contemporary bands at your time? Because the Beatles were a little ahead of you, uh, going to Germany and doing the Liverpool thing and then going to Germany. But who were who were the guys who were playing, say, the person that would play, or, or the band that would play with you at night at, at, at your gigs? What we wanted was we'd see, we'd see Wayne Fontana and the Mind Band because he was a young guy and he was very good he was entertaining and he was a good singer so he would always have a we'd see him at the oasis in manchester and liverpool i like the undertakers and the escorts and the big three and the searchers and the searchers were kind of a bit lightweight compared to the other ones because they had five singers in the band and they could do you know folk music and rock and roll and that american coasters thing you know love potion number mm -hmm. nine sweets for my sweet sweets for my sweet mm -hmm. sugar for my honey <laughs> so they were very entertaining because the five people in the band singing they had a big repertoire and we and jerry and the pacemakers mm -hmm. were like he he was my idol because he was funny. He was a funny stand-up comedian. And I, and I don't know if you know, the Beatles, before they made it, were really funny, funny people on yeah. stage. They yeah. all had this great... Mm -hmm. it's, just, it's a, a magic. You know, I, I, I got a ticket from the show. I went to see them August 1963. And they'd just come back from Germany. And they had a new drummer. And the one... One of the guys with me during their show quit show business. They were so good that he decided that he could not be a competitor. Oh. I, I can't. Oh, I can't. Wow. I'm screwed. We're not, I'm, I'm done. And he left the band. But the thing that was good about them was they, they had this great interaction between each other as if it was like it was kind of non-theatrical. You could see that they were enjoying being with each other and it was just this great kind of football team, American English football team. Mm -hmm. And you liked the idea, you know, and that attracted me. And I, and I decided that my band would have that going on. Yeah. That we would all inspire each other j during the show. I mean, if you look at those old Ed Sullivan show, you see us looking at each other like, isn't this great? Yeah. <laughs> you can yeah. see that look on our face. Mm -hmm. Can you believe this world? The bloody Ed Sullivan show. <laughs> H-E-N. Why are you <laughs> joking? You know? So there was that kind of thing that we'd learned from the Beatles and Jerry and the Pacemakers because he had a brother in the band as well, Jerry. I and, love them. Very cross oh, the Rosie. great. And great song, and he was a real stand-up performer. You know, I thought, oh, I'd like to be some of that. And when I first saw the Beatles, the, the lead singer was John Lennon, and the other guys were his band. You know, I mean, it, the early Beatles was John Lennon and some others. And bit by bit, they all became more and more demonstrative mm -hmm. on stage. And uh, And I decided I wanted to be in this band where I could be creative you know we do my boy lollipop and we do mrs brown you've got a lovely daughter and we do i'm leaning on the lamppost because we had aspirations to be like jerry and the pacemakers mm -hmm. who could do all that stuff and he was a great guitar player and and i remember once i was i was a really young kid and i got in the one of the litherland town hall something in liverpool and i and i saw george harrison who was going to be in the who was probably already in the beatles watching Jerry mm -hmm. Marsden's guitar thing fingering, you know, oh, wow. you know, like in awe. Yeah. So it must have been that 
I was so far away from being a guitar player, but I noticed that other guitar players were watching Jerry Mars and therefore he must be good because yeah. he could play. He could go, dan, 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 da, dan, dan, I like it. Mm -hmm. But what's you know interesting what I mean? is you, you know, when you saw, the bar, you saw the bar really high after 10,000 hours or whatever they put in in Germany, you saw a high bar and you ran towards it. Your buddy was like, I'm out of here. So that says a lot about your personality. He actually used a, a four-letter word, we're ucked. And uh, <laughs> he was he was done. He did not want to be, and it 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 was kind of dis depressed him that he could never arrive at. No matter how hard he worked, he would never be able to be that good as Paul McCartney. He was a bass player, so you know there's a thing about it. you see you can decide to be a bass player, and people don't know until they've got a good one mm -hmm. how important he is to the whole feel of the band. I mean, the difference between the difference from the Beatles when they had Peter on the drums and the difference when they had Ringo is really chalk and cheese, as my grandmother would say. There was complete, there was, uh, suddenly the Beatles were completely free to, to take a break yeah. instead of yeah. sticking with the drummer all the time. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. It was like, and I, and I learned from the Beatles and other people at the same time is if you do not have to think about what anybody else in the play anybody else on the stage is doing, feeling confident that they know their lines and they know what to do, it opens you up to do all kinds of stuff. You know, I started off at the cabin hiding behind a microphone stand. Right. You know, I was about 100 pounds and I could stand behind mm -hmm. the microphone stand and hope nobody could see me. <laughs> and after after 200,000 hours, I finally got free. I freed up my hands. Oh, I can do things with my hands. Because yeah. some some famous musician entertainer told me you know well you know if you just do something with your hands people will think you're an entertainer <laughs> <laughs> well what i love about your sirius xm show which is on two to five o'clock called something good and i just love it because of your anecdotes and you're, you you talk exactly the way you do now telling these little stories about when you got started you're always very complimentary of these bands you started with and you you come at them as if you're a fan and i love that and i wonder if when you're in the environment and you're all struggling for the same gigs were you as supportive of one another or was it much more competitive than that what a great idea yeah yeah the thing england was a very small scene very everybody knew each other and if you didn't know them, you knew what they were doing because somebody else would tell you. People forget, you know, it's like over time, Fritz, you, you realize that you knew people. Like I, I'd, I'd be in New York and Jack Bruce had a new record out. And Jack Bruce was in a load of bands. Mm -hmm. And he reminded me that in like in 1963, he'd seen Herman's Hermits get in a fight. Wow. And I remember the fight and, and I remember the, there was a bunch of bands in the fight because we would stop at these truck stops. They were called transport cafes in England. And for some reason, one of the worst things that, you, that somebody could shout at you was, are you a boy or a girl? Mm -hmm. And that offended us. So what happened, my mother had this coffee table and it, and it was a low coffee table and it had these screw in legs and we had the, each one of us had a screw in leg up our sleeve. <laughs> like that. And, and if this trouble would start, we'd get, and Jack Bruce told me that he was there when I said to somebody, you have to hit them first, because if you don't hit them first, they will get your dobber <laughs> and they will hit me with it. <laughs> and it was like, wow. we couldn't fight to save our lives. No member of Herman Summits could have fought their way out of a wet paper bag. So we had these things. And he reminded us that the, if a fight started, all the group, all the members of groups would all join in. And we learn everything from other groups. We knew nothing. We still don't know a lot. But we learned this was a bad promoter. This guy will try to, you know, there was this, <laughs> like this Fritz. So... We would play this place and the guy would say, I was, for some reason, I was the youngest kid in the band by about three years, mm -hmm. but I was the businessman. <laughs> you know, I had a suit. That's all I had over there. I got a suit, <laughs> so I'll do the business. And we'd go to get paid and, and he'd go, how much, how much was it again? Uh, six pounds. He says, I'm going to give you four pounds. 
What do you mean you're going to give us four pounds? Well, people were dancing. <laughs> well, yeah, people were dancing. Well, if people are dancing, what do I need a group for? I can just have a DJ play records for nothing. Oh, my God. And that, so we would learn about this. And then you would hear that story from 10 different people. Oh, you're going up to Scunthorpe. Watch out for that guy there who tries to tell people <laughs> dancing. Make sure you get paid before you go and say. So there was this whole scene going on. I still live with those rules for it. So I would say, you know, I met Chuck Berry along the road, you know, and he was being mean to somebody about money. And I said, you know what, Chuck? It doesn't look cool, you, with that big wad of money in your pocket on stage. Because we don't want <laughs> right. money. He insisted on being paid in cash before the gig, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And he said, Peter, I play a lot better when the money's in my pocket. <laughs> wow. <laughs> and he'd been so screwed know, over. I've, I said I've, many... I've, I've, Oh, yeah. I, I, all the African-American performers got screwed early. I totally understand why he was doing that. Yeah, but you guys, when you guys broke in America, it was it was kind of like maybe you were too young to break in the U.K. the way you were going to break in America because we think everything British is adorable. And then you were super young and you go on Ed Sullivan and he kind of embraced you the way all the moms who bought all the records for their kids. And you're literally singing lyrics that are respectful to somebody's mom. So, but Ed Sullivan didn't even bother to learn how to pronounce your names. He just, he just liked you. Yeah, my friend, Peter Herman Moon. Is that what he said? <laughs> That's what he said. Moon? Yeah, he was, he was a lovely guy. I can't think of anything bad to say about Ed Sullivan. So he was just, you know, but what happened was, you see, one day we were playing in the cavern and then we had a, a fan and her name was Margaret. Mm -hmm. That's all we know about her. And she would sit on the side of the stage. She would sit on the cavern stage. Right on the stage. Looking, looking at us like this. And we'd, we'd say, hello, Margaret, and we'd get <laughs> on with it. Nobody ever dated her. Nobody ever asked her. She would eat a sandwich and drink a drink and she <laughs> watch the band, right? And then a week or two later, she came with a friend. So now there were two of them. And then five weeks after that, there were 10 of them. And then suddenly there was like 30 girls. Margaret is a social media out. influencer. <laughs> <laughs> then, then, then we had a hit record and all those 30 people knew each other and they all came at the same time. And, and we, we showed up, we were doing a date in Liverpool with Dusty Springfield and we showed up and she let us go on her bus. You know, we were not welcome on anybody's bus, wow. certainly not a diva bus, you know. And it was just a bus. <laughs> it wasn't a posh bus. It didn't have a bedroom or anything. She said, you can use the bus, just don't use the room in the back. Mm -hmm. And no smoking, which was unheard of in the 60s. On Everybody smoked. The mm -hmm. only person in England who didn't smoke was Dusty Springfield. Got it. <laughs> yeah. So we get on this bus and we pull into the back door of the Liverpool Empire and there are thousands of girls seriously thousands of girls this is england this isn't america this okay. is way before we came to america yeah they're all shouting my name herman 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 Her <laughs> all that and you know it, i was embarrassed i go oh my god how must this feel for dusty she's headliner and all the people are screaming for me and i was embarrassed i didn't go yeah this is my making it now <laughs> I felt bad for her, you know, because she'd let us on her tour and we'd broken during the tour and we came to America and all that was just multiplied. So yeah. the first gig we did, I remember it was this, this fantastic disc jockey called Gene K, and it was Allentown, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, that border there. And we were playing in a high school and it was our first ever gig in America. Um, and Gene K goes on stage, here they are from England. <laughs> 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 you know, this big thing. Yeah. And you could sense that this is a big deal. And the band used to play this sort of... Da, 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 yeah. And I would walk on. Herman's Hermits, but I wouldn't walk on. There'd be a little bit of a show busy break, and then Herman would come. And I walked out on the stage during this intro, and everybody, everybody in the audience came on stage. What? We had no security. We didn't know about security. In England, you had one policeman and no one passed him, you know. But stop. Oh, sorry. sorry. Uh, <laughs> they all got calm, right? But they just joined us on the stage. And we were very, we were about, I think I was 16. Oh, my God. And I didn't know how to manage 400 girls at the same time. <laughs> so we basically ran away. And they <sighs> took all our gear. Oh, 
and we all dis- we ran away. You know, we had ties ripped out off. Oh, and oh my. Well, it was great. It was actually, you know, but we didn't know what to do. So, so the show was stopped. We never, I never sang a note. We lost a load of gear, and then we went on to another date. And the next time, we we said we need a couple of cops at the front, you know, and then ten cops. It just grew. It, it, it's kind of like that, and you know, it is. Once, once I was doing this gig with an, with an old African American lady, and it wasn't very busy. And she said, "The end looks a lot like the beginning, doesn't it?" Oh, oh wow! So when you did your first tour, it wasn't the end. Fortunately, oh. it wasn't the end. Uh, uh, when you did your first tour over here, w- w- did you tour alone as Herman's Hermits, or were you that with other one, bands? Yeah. That first one we did, then we got really lucky. So Dick Clark had mm-hmm. a thing called the Caravan of right. Stars. Yeah. And we had an agent, and we got this agent because we said, who have you got? That's all we knew how to say to an agent. You want an agent? Yeah. There's an agent. Who have you got? Mm-hmm. And this agent said to me, got Freddie Cannon and Gary U.S. Bonds. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I almost fainted because those were the two most important acts in my world. Oh. You know, that was 10 Beatles was yeah. Freddie Cannon. Yeah. And oh. 100 Rolling Stones was Gary U.S. Bonds. Yeah. And we signed with him. And the first thing he got us was 84 dates on the Dick Clark Caravan of Stars, direct from Britain. You know, British Invade, whatever they say at the bottom. And we started as the opening act on this show, and it was Little Anthony and Imperials, oh my. our heroes, uh, Bobby V, Freddie Cannon, uh, the I Can Tina Turner, the Arquettes, the Detergents, the Shangri-Las, <clears throat> all on the same bus. Wow. And we got on the bus, and we, during the t- during this bus ride, see, what, what Dick Clark had seen was he saw that Miss, I'm into something good was in the charts. He could get us for 500 bucks a night. And and no no expenses paid, just five hundred bucks a night, and then you know no hotels, no food. Oh lord! So so we thought that was a good deal compared to English money, and there's eighty four of them. So you know me, I go oh sixteen seventeen thousand dollars, lads. Whoo, let's start. <laughs> Not realizing eighty four days is a long time, and yeah. the, the, by the time you paid the agent and everybody, so. We started off in these little, like high schools and high school stadiums, you know, that room where they play basketball. Mm. And bit by bit, it moved into stadiums because we had three records in the top 20 during this tour because they would get me up for it. Louise, every morning they'd get me up at 4 a.m. and take me in a station wagon to a, a field with a huge antenna in it where I'd go and eat, meet Big the Bop of Jean, whatever his name was, the morning. Hey, yeah. Big the Bop of Jean. Here <laughs> <laughs> uh, is from England, Hermit, Hermit. <laughs> you know, all that stuff. And I would do promotion. And what I was doing was promoting Dick Clark's show that night in Roanoke, Virginia, for example. Mm. But I was also promoting Herman's Home. It's got always kind of cute accent, you know, and all that <laughs> stuff. And bit by bit, the band exploded. And... One thing we had going for us that none of the other people had was that I'd made some weird decision, like when I was 16, that I would sing songs with my own accent. I wouldn't do ham, yeah. I wasn't going to do that <laughs> because that would make me sound like Buddy Holly, and there's already a Buddy Holly. So I'll do Buddy Holly songs with an English accent. Why do you miss when my baby kisses me? And it'd be even more charming, and then it'll be me. <laughs> and, and we had a PR guy, uh, he had two acts, yeah. the Rolling Stones and Herman's Hermits, a genius guy called Andrew Oldham. And he he decided that the Stones were going to be the bad boys of rock. And he said, and you guys, you can be the good boys of rock. I said, well, it's going to be tough on me, that being, having to pretend to be a bad guy all the time. You know, it's a full-time job, that. <laughs> He said, well, how about you uh, being a good guy? I said, oh, we don't have to work hard on that. We're already <laughs> good guys. <laughs> We don't have to pretend to be nice people. We just, I'm sorry. It's so boring, isn't it? I I know that's boring for a PR person, but we never did anything. You know, we've never been. See, that's what got the parents buying the records for the kids. That's what's got you in the door. And I know, for me personally, and I'm sure everyone can attest to this, when I go around the house singing your songs, I do sing them in a British accent. Good, good, good. I like that. That's that's how you learn them. That's how you sing them. That's right. (laughs) 
H E N R Y. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. You know uh, uh, that 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 to me when I when I read your back. Well, first of all, you, one of the great business decisions you made is your first two managers were also songwriters. That seems like you're saving a lot of money doing that. <laughs> they made a lot of money. They weren't good songwriters. Oh, oh there we go. But the other <laughs> thing I, I I enjoyed learning was that you have an uncanny ability to pick the right songs. For instance, Carol King wrote something good, right? And t tell us how that song presented itself to you. You know, I, I once again, I can't take credit for something that wasn't me. We had a producer called Mickey Most, and he and I, for some reason, it's like Jimi Hendrix and that guy who, who produced the Jimi Hendrix records. Although we're Chaz not- Chaz Chandler? Pardon? Chaz Chandler, you mean the guy from no, the no, animals? No, the, guy, the guy who produced them, I can't, oh. I can't remember the name now, a South African guy. Oh. And, and um, Mickey and I hit it off. I'd say to Mickey, you know that reverb on Walk Right Back by the Everly Brothers? Mm -hmm. And he go, oh, you mean this? Oh yeah, that's it. <laughs> he knew he knew how to make records with the animals as well. He, he made all those great records with the animals where he found exactly the right song for Eric Burden. And he found I'm into something good. He said, I got this song. It's, it's by Earl Jean. Learn it and come and record it. And we came in and we listened to it. And I hate to I admit it now. We thought it was a surf song. We mm -hmm. thought, oh, it's like surf music. And we couldn't, we couldn't play it. And Mickey had a friend called Roger Webb who had the Roger Webb trio, who was a piano player. And he's got this, Roger, you know anything about surf music? And he goes, well, let's hear the song. And he goes, did it, did it, did it, did it. And he made it into a surf, what we thought was a surf record. And it was just a great song, remember? And, mm -hmm. and then, and then soon after that, we did we 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 had a song in our show called Silhouettes, yeah. and we really did it a bit a bit fifties. It was da 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 da. You know, eh, last eh, night. Eh, yeah, right. Like, like, what 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 do 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 do? <laughs> and hmm. it was just flick flicks. Somebody who see the small scene. People love to be on each other's records. They didn't say, oh, I need 15% of the beast. I did, did, did. There was none of that. So this guy called Vic Flick, who was in the James, the John Barry 7, and he's the guy who played the James Bond theme. So that's, that's Vic Flick. And Vic says, so we're trying to say, we're doing it. I'm sitting on the piano going, and he goes, I got a lick, and his name is Vic Flick. Yes. Oh my I God. got a lick. Vic Flick's got a lick. <laughs> so we go, da 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 So once again, somebody from nothing to do, did, I think he got nine pounds for the session. Wow. He's the person who made that song into a hit because mm -hmm. the song was already around. Anybody could have a go at that, but he came up with it. Dun, 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 that made it into a 60s song. So catchy. Then, bad news, the next record, Sam Cooke gets murdered, shot dead five times by accident in a, in a parking lot in New York. <laughs> and in, in Los Angeles, and Mickey calls me, he says, Sam Cooke's been murdered. We're doing a tribute. Eric Burden's over here. And we're doing Bring It On Home to Me. Oh. And, I, and I can hear Chaz. Yeah. I said, <laughs> well, that's nothing like Lou, Lou Rawls. <laughs> Sa Eric's doing a great... I'm on the phone to get, reviewing a record, yes. right? <laughs> and, and he said, get, get yourself over here. So I get there. I said, I want to do Cupid. He goes, why do you want to do Cupid? I said, because, listen, I can make that sound. You know, the arrow. <laughs> said, that is the worst thing I've ever, that's the worst idea I've ever heard. I'll bite, listen, Peter, don't know much about history. Yeah. Yeah. Don't know much about trigonometry. Yeah. Who does that sound like? <laughs> oh, man. A kid who's still in there. high school. <laughs> get in there and do it. It's called don't. It's called Wonderful World. Don't know much about history. Yeah. Don't know much about biology. And I walk in the room, and there's Jimmy Page on guitar, oh. and he goes, he goes, "Hello, Herman." <laughs> Both that. Hello, Herman. What we as is this to it? What's your key there? I said, I don't know. I've never sung the song. Before. <laughs> 
I don't know what key it's in. I only just know a bit of it, you know, because I bought the record like eight years ago. And he goes, well, it's so, so he, he says, okay. So we go run through it. One, da 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 da. And he goes, it's boring. Jimmy says, it's boring. Wow. Let's cut the intro in half. Da 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 da. da. Don't know much about yeah. right. Okay. Well, we all get the message. We're all in on it, except the drummer, <laughs> who is the most famous drummer in England. He's messing with his cymbal or something. Got his headset off and misses that thing. So the whole of the record, the drummer is a whole section behind everybody until we get to the bridge. And Mickey goes, that's it, next. We go, wait a second, the drummer's not playing the same song as us. Oh, my. And he goes, you never, you never be able to sing it as good as that. I said, give me one more go. No. Next, Jimmy, double track that. Jimmy has to double track his guitar solo, which he's only played once in his life ever. So now he's expected, and we time is money. Time is money. Wow. So our next single was made like in a suddenly, you know, we'll get over there at nine o'clock in the morning at nine fifteen. The record's done with the drummer playing a different feel to everybody oh, else. Wow. wow. So whose decision was it to do Henry the Eighth, which was written in nineteen ten as a dance hall hit in England? You no. Know, it, it's it, got it, the catchiest it, hook of any song ever. <laughs> I think that's it. You know, we everybody knew the song. You see, in England, there's these songs that everybody knows. It's like if you go to Liverpool, they'll sing "When You Walk Through a Storm," uh, "Hold Your Head Up," and they know all the words. Wow! And there's a, there's lots of songs from before that, like that we must have learned from our grandparents. And I, I tell you, my grandfather used to sing Henry the Eighth, but it's not the version I do. But he was dead by the time it gets, by the time I got to this recording studio, oh. and and he would at Christmas he would have a rum and peppermint. <laughs> it's an odd drink. I'll have a rum and peppermint. Yeah. He was from Ireland. I'd have yeah. a rum and peppermint, please. And then he would get on the piano. I didn't play the piano. He would get up on the piano and he would sing. <laughs> <laughs> Think, well, that was his bit, you know, at the end of an even, Granddad gets on top of the piano. Okay. It, it was an upright piano, so it was a bit of a climb. It was a climb. <laughs> so, so he would get on the piano and he'd sing any old iron, any old iron. These are the English people's songs. Okay. These songs are for English people, and there's some English people here. Because <laughs> Irish people don't necessarily, they're not necessarily fans of English people, so... He would sing all these Any Old Iron, which is a song from the war when they collected iron from every steal your gate because they needed it to make weapons right. and stuff, right? So they'd take your gate and anything that was iron, the railings and everything. So he'd sing this song, Any Old Iron, and we'd not know what it was about, but we'd all join in and sing all the <laughs> words. Sometime, uh, there was a, and then he would sing this song called Henry VIII, but he sang it like, I'm Henry VIII, I am Henry VIII. I am, I am, I got married to the widow next door. Different tune in it. So we get in there and Mickey goes, we, we say, well, we've got this hit, Mrs. Brown, you've got a lovely daughter. We need to, we need a follow up for it. So I said, what do you, what do you, it's a song that we all know. And we go, lean on a lamppost. I'm leaning on a, yeah, yeah, that's pretty good. Then what else? I go, well, we all know Henry VIII and, and Lex, Lex, our guitar player says, and I'll do like a, a, a a Chuck Berry intro on it will make it kind of modern. And I've got, but modern isn't Chuck Berry. Wouldn't it be more modern if you had like a Paul McCartney bass on it? No, no, but Chuck Berry. And, and this is kind of that sinister thing where a group grow into something special by each taking a bit of energy from the other person. So, right. and then ba- and he says, and, ba- and Barry can play chuck, 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 yeah. chuck, chuck, and, and so, uh, so we start singing it. And of course, as everything, all our songs are kind of in the moment, they, they have their moment. And if you lose that moment and move on to another thing, it doesn't ever recover. You know, it's like, anyway, so, so we can't recover the moment. So we start playing the thing and Mickey's always recording everything. He always recorded everything. And he probably didn't know it was recording. He just, if the machine was going <laughs> around, like that, you know, didn't know what any of the buttons did. Maybe your granddad so, had sat on it. So he records it. And, and when we get past what's, what's the first, you know, letter A, letter B, we ain't in that world yet. We're going first bit, second bit, chorus, bridge, 
chorus out. You know, that's the way we work. So at the end of what's the first verse musically, which is really the chorus, I say second verse, same as the first. It could have been do, whack-a-doo, whack-a-doo, whack-a-doo. <laughs> it could have been anything that big band people said to each other. Like my dad was in a band with his brother and they would pass messages to, uh, to each other. Do, whack-a-doo, whack-a-doo was one of the messages. And so that, and that Mickey left that in. He thought that was very amusing. So the genius of Mickey most keeping that thing, it's like in that mamas and papas, I saw her. I saw her yeah. till the end last oh. night. If you leave, mm -hmm. sometimes you leave the mistake and it makes everything, freshens everything up. And yeah. then, you know, how we ended that song, I'll never know because there was some sort of mystery that in in the chemistry of the group that we kind of knew what each other was going to do. You know, you could trust the other person to do the right thing. Mm -hmm. So you go, da 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 Oh. which is a big band ending from hell. You know what I mean? All those big <laughs> bands, they always, it's called Broadway. Broadway Ballet Who Ended. Da, 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 We all did it and we all stopped at the same time and we looked at each other and go, shit, that was great. That's a record, uh, yeah. <laughs> But I mean, I watched on, you can see this on YouTube, is when you performed for the Queen Mom, and Ooh. you guys had like a cabaret act. Can you believe it? I st you know, th we thought it was live television, you see. You <laughs> see, that they would do this thing that they would say, this is a live television. And sometimes 30 years later, you found out that it wasn't really live. Somebody at the record, at the BBC or whoever had a tape of it. So 40 years after we did it, maybe more than four, maybe 50 years after we did it, somebody shows me a copy of that and I'd never seen it. Oh. And I, I was totally in shock. And I called the living members of Herman's Hermits and I said, did, did you ever see that Royal <laughs> Command performance? And they go, no. I said, well, let me ask you before, before, before you see it, <laughs> did anybody, like a manager or a road <laughs> manager or your mom, or, <laughs> Or somebody you met <laughs> tell you you were absolutely brilliant. <laughs> well, no, not even your mom. <laughs> oh, nobody said anything. I said that's why we quit. We quit because we thought we were doing all this great work, and it wasn't good. It was great. <laughs> it was great. It was wasn't amazing. It great. I mean, the, the hermits had never wanted to be dancers. They danced under pressure. You know, like, dance, oh, you have to pay extra. You have to pay extra for that dance. <laughs> and they, they were well, talking. It's, I, it's I got it all. It's got it all. If you if you're what if you're listening to this at home, go to YouTube and put Royal Performance, Herman Sermons, and then call me. Okay. Go ahead, Fritz. <laughs> uh, I, I but but I'll tell you what I'm astonished by and, and you know, it's not like you're starting your career. Your touring schedule is insane. Uh, no, I'm going to give people your dates upcoming here. Thank you. The 28th of January, you're at the uh, Ameristar Casino in Kansas City. And then on February 3rd, you're in Stars of the 60s at Claremont, Florida. Then 6th, you're with the Hermits at Tomball, Texas. And this goes on and on like you're not off for longer than three days at a time, all the way through August 22nd, where you're going to make your first appearance at the Wisconsin Dells. This is an insane schedule. You're not a young man, Peter. He's pretty young. We, we, we like 118. The magic number is 118. <laughs> man. And we've got 72 of them so far. But here's what I wanted to say about we that. Like to, I say to my agent, 10 more years. I, he just called me before. We just got another date in uh, Hot Springs, Arkansas on June 25th. And uh, when before I hang up, I say, thanks, Howie, 10 more years. And we've been saying that now for about 11 years. I like that. I like that. <laughs> but but I, I would bet with the darkness of the world today, Fans that come to your shows and they hear your sweet lyrics. I mean, Mrs. Brown, You've Got a Lovely Daughter has to be one of the sweetest lyrics ever written in popular music. It it's makes a, it gives me goosebumps. It's a sad and polite song. It is, and it's positive, and it seems like shows now in our current environment would be very therapeutic. I bet people just come out of your shows feeling 100% better. Well, you hope, you hope so, because I think when we made the records we 
it was Mickey Mouse's idea. I'm not going to take credit for it. He said, we have to make records that come on right after the news. Mm. Well, that's really Wow, that guy was really thinking 360. Because remember, we only made records for the BBC. There was only one outlet for music in England. Mm-hmm. We never made a record for America. Mm-hmm. We didn't know anything about America. We came to America. We went in the recording studio. We didn't know what to do. We have news here, too, though. So, so we made records. So, so there would always be, I'm into something good, wonderful world. There's a kind of hush all over the world. Sunshine Girl, something is happening. All the titles were things, you know, Boom, news at nine across from the rain, more rain coming in the <laughs> That's your pop, Rich. And then <laughs> then that's the downer on your you're done with. And then they go the pound at an all time new low against the dollar. <laughs> it will not affect the devaluation will not affect the pound in your pocket. Look up this morning feeling <laughs> You don't even so it was time the to contrast. Dwell on it. Boy, that's great. Yeah. That's counter programming. I love that. <laughs> well, we posted on Facebook uh, to let folks know that we were going to be speaking to you and see if they have any questions. So I'm just going to mention some names and then I'm going to pick up uh, one question here for Bonnie Kent wrote. She has your albums. Kim Undermutter Domovich uh, wants to know how how Mrs. Brown's daughter is holding up. This guy wants to know how old you are. The you know, Siri can tell you that. Terry Backnap wants to thank you for what you did for Mike Smith from Dave Clark Five. Ah, uh, yeah. Poor yeah. Dave. Poor Mike, yeah. And then yeah, Susan McGiver wrote, do you ha- ever look back and think that you should have done things differently and what would you have changed if you could, if you could go back and change it? When, when I look back, I only look back about a couple of years. I started this thing called Facebook Live where I go on Facebook yes. and, I, and I bring people into my house and I sell. What happened was we had 118 concerts booked and they all got rescheduled. Mm-hmm. And what was happening was all the, the souvenirs that we'd had shipped to all these different events. Cause oh. I used to go out after every show and sign autographs. Cause I, I think it's nice for me to meet the people oh, yeah. who came to the show and they, it's mem- they remember, they remember it and everything. But now I was stuck and my house and my garage was <laughs> filling up with oh, t-shirts and CDs all mine. Yeah. Yeah. You no, know, I couldn't play them more than once each. <laughs> so I, st- I started this Facebook page and I would sign autographs and sell CDs live, sort of live. And it was a huge success. And I, and it, and it inspired me to get, you know, I, I was like, Oh, I was doing it all day and all night. And then work came back. Mm-hmm. And now I'm like, now I'm under pressure to deliver T-shirts and stuff, uh, oh. you know, and, and take. Oh, and, and what I did was I, I made it like a kind of fun thing so that the whole of the thing would be fun. It would be, be fun when I signed it and I'd play the song in the background and sing along with it and everything. Yeah. And then I would take it myself to the post office and take a picture of me mailing it to you. Oh, that's it was a whole wow. kind of, that's a whole kind like of run on t- thing. Old timey showbiz. <laughs> Virtual, virtual autograph signings. Yeah. But you, you, if, if there are three people in America that haven't heard your show on Sirius XM on weekends, something good, you, you are honestly one of the most entertaining people. And the fact that it's all sound and no visuals makes it even, I love the theater of the mind aspect about it because you do great voices. You're like a stand-up comedian and you have the best anecdotes. I remember one day you were talking about the crazy world of Arthur Brown who had yeah. that song Fire. And I think I think it was the longest monologue ever about Arthur Brown. I said, oh, Arthur, <laughs> here's this. And, and what a great performer he was. And you talked about him and you talked about Georgie Fame. And I think at one time, I think he had done the he had done the soundtrack to Bonnie and Clyde or something you were talking about. I, I mean, I love the uh, musicology part of your show. I mean, I love the songs too, but you've got the best anecdotes. But Fritz, it, the thing the thing that makes it very easy is I knew I know or I knew all the people that I talk well, about. Well, that's I mean, what makes they, it good. Yeah, it gives a credibility. They, they may not have liked me. But, you know, I mean, <laughs> seriously, you know, you don't know. It's like I, ha- I, I think if you listen to it, I have this one. I have many idiosyncrasies, but one thing that I've always did, and I call it selective onset Tourette syndrome. <laughs> if I meet Elvis Presley, I have to stop myself from going. Well, since my baby left me, <laughs> you just do <laughs> them to them. Is. Yeah, like if I saw Arthur Brown now, I'd go fire. <laughs> <laughs> it's a weird thing. So I talk about it because. 
you know, it was like I, I was walking along the street in New York and I saw Jack Bruce. And I went, in my white room. <laughs> Are you working because on your Fritz impression? That, no, please. <laughs> that was it. Don't, don't, uh, don't stop doing that. I love That's it. That's so and, cool. And, and, if you'll permit me one oh, thing. Oh, yeah. I, 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 I think we need to talk about Natalie. Yeah, Nate, your so beautiful, good. talented daughter. She's so good. Who is also a, like a Rolodex of interesting music information. And the, the same way you are, what, what, did you take her on the road? What was her exposure and where did this interest of hers come from? You know, the interest was that Sirius wanted somebody younger talking about the music from then. Okay. Oh. Other than me, which I think is a good idea because, you know, a lot of people listen to the show who aren't my age, who are at least two generations younger than that, mm -hmm. you know, some twenties and that. So, it's good to look at it from the aspect of looking up to it rather than I'm in it. Right. Because most of the disc jockeys on the radio are in it. You know, it's like when I think of coming to America and meeting, you know, those famous disc jockeys at the time, they were really in the music. They were in it. And, and I'm in it. And all my stories, once Davy Jones, the guy from the monkeys, he, he said the most ridiculous things to me, you know, like I said, listen, Davy, all you ever talk about is yourself. And he said, Peter, all my stories have me in them. <laughs> that brilliant? It is. That is. So now, now what I find is all my stories have me in them, but I'm sometimes the camera. Uh, I'm sometimes yeah. part of the story, but a lot of the time I'm in the room with Mick Jagger and Keith yeah. Richards. Well, because I, you and I are peers, I, 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 I appreciate your point of view, but I see what you're saying about Natalie. She's more objective. She's the observer from a couple of generations down. And, so but she, she's a musician as well, right? She's a very good musician. She's uh, she's 9.9 .9 months pregnant this month. Oh, my goodness. Wow. And she's having a little baby probably today. To, the day oh, the day my God. Day. Well, we'll more than ever. So good for her. She's get some more noons on the planet. Congratulations. What, what, what are her, the hours of her show, Peter? I, I, I can't remember. How she's it, on Sunday, 5 to 8. That's right. Yeah. I think what's interesting is everything is so discoverable right now. Like when we were kids, you had to go through your parents' record collection or hope that your granddad would sing something and remind you of the lyrics or teach it to you. But now, if you're interested in something that happened before you came to the planet, you can you can find it. And it's so much fun. And she knows how to research. You know, yeah. she went to Belmont in, in Tennessee and did and learn how to, you know, if you want to find something, if you want to find out something and you bother to, like, if, for example, if you want to know about Ferrari, you can go to, to yeah. Google Ferrari and you'll find out how he met Maserati and, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. and the whole thing it becomes overwhelming. You know, me, I, I don't do that much searching because it, I, more information equals more confusion to me. Well. So I don't really know what I know, um, you know, like I only talk, I, I said it once, my, my mother once said to me, if you don't have something nice to say about something, uh, somebody, don't say anything at all. And then I play their record. <laughs> oh, my God. I love that. <laughs> but That's I don't adorable. say anything about them. That's adorable. I got it. Okay, so you're editing and she, yourself. And she, and she, she admires everybody. Yeah, because, you can tell. You know, She's... If you never had a hit record, the person who has a hit record has something to be admired for. Just one. See, they don't know. A young person doesn't know if you've got this massive amount of work, like Simon and Garfunkel they started out as acoustic duo and they grew into this thing. You just know Simon and Garfunkel. You go and look at them and you find, you know, go right to the big, juicy stuff. Mm -hmm. But she has to research and find out, you know, she doesn't have the knowledge of being in it. I was in it. Right. But she has the ability to tell the tale and stick a little uh, tidbit in there, which makes it fascinating to me. She's doing her research. Well, you, you, you know, Fritz, one of the things, it's like the Grammys. I went to the Grammys, and I think me and Tom Jones were sitting next to each other. <laughs> wow. And, and it's Henry Mancini. In those days, it wasn't a drummer and his stripper girlfriend. It was, it was <laughs> big, big stars, yeah. big, big musical, I mean, you could say genius. Legends. Henry Mancini. Yeah. All the people who are at the Grammys, and it's in a theater in New York, and we're sitting there, and I'm with Tom Jones, and he's record of the year, mm -hmm. and I think Herman Summers have got two songs of the year, right? And I get to sit behind Art Garfunkel. Wow. Who has hair. He has big hair. <laughs> sure. more, he, has more, he has a bigger hair yeah. than, than the hat that you don't wear when you meet the queen because she makes her feel like a midget. <laughs> sure. 
so he's got this massive hair and and Tom looks at me because I got, he's got Paul Simon who oh, you can you know so he's he had like a this better over the top a foot lower than than <laughs> Art's head sure. and Art's got the hair on top of that and we sit in there and they say record of the year and the guy he's got the envelope he goes and we think he's going to say Simon and Garfunkel, and so do they. Mm-hmm. So do they. <laughs> so, do they. Oh, wow. so they start to stand up and he goes, Statler Brothers, Flowers on the wow. Wall. Wow. Statler <laughs> Brothers. Flowers on the Wall beat Sounds of Silence. Yeah. I go, Are you oh my God. kidding me? There was like a hush all over the room. You know what I mean? Oh, my goodness. Look, how could... And then when you listen to it, it's a pretty good record, It's right? a good record. Yeah. Yeah. Hair got yeah. You got his hair shrank. Mm-hmm. But wow. you know, all those memories come back when you hear the record. I remember, oh, sitting behind Art Gonfungal and Tom Jones. And, you know, Tom Jones is like one of the best British singers from oh, the British oh, invasion. Oh, it's just... It just took one pair of pink panties to get him out of the rock and roll seat. <laughs> <laughs> Brown Prince of rock and roll. <laughs> Gets a bra thrown at him, and then now it's some sort of fluffy entertainer. Because he's a great singer. He should have replaced Elvis Presley. Oh, I mean, yeah. all those Rod Stewart's and all those, they're good singers, but Tom was so oh, Tom, than yeah. everybody else. He's a musician. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, it's been such a blast to talk with you, Peter, and we really do appreciate you spending this time with us. Fritz is going to tell people how they can review our show, at, which would be advantageous to us alone. You are an extremely entertaining person. I'm, I'm just recommending people listen to you every week, Pete. It was a pleasure. If you enjoyed this episode of Media Path, it would help us to be more discoverable by potential new listeners. If you leave us a quick review on Apple Podcasts, and if you're new here and this is your first time with us, please check out our back catalog. You may find something binge-worthy. Thank you for spending an hour with us, and we would be overjoyed if you took a moment to share your thoughts with us or recommend us to a friend. And we would love for you to join us online on Instagram and Twitter, where we are at Media Path. Pod and on Facebook, where we are Media Path Podcast. We also have a Facebook group called Media Path Podcast with Fritz and Wheezy. You can find full episodes with all kinds of bonus visual content on our YouTube channel, Media Path Podcast. We would love to know what media you have been enjoying. You can contact us at our social media or email us at mediapathpodcast at gmail.com. We want to thank our wonderfully entertaining guest, Peter Noon. You can go to peternoon.com. Is that's the correct? Yeah, or, or the, I've got that Peter Noon Herman Summit's Facebook, which is the, where yes. I do the live stuff. Absolutely. And we're going to have links to all of that stuff in our show notes. Thank you. So you can find Peter. Our team includes Dina Friedman, Francesco Namanda, John Maddox, Sharon Bellio, Bill Filippiak, Thomas Hubble, Mason Brown, and you. Our theme music is by me and John Maddox. I am Louise Palenker, here with Fritz Coleman, and we will see you along the media path. Anywhere else people can find you online, Peter? Uh, Peter Noon, Herman Scrum, it's Facebook, PeterNoon.com. I do a cameo thing as well, which is a load of fun. I, uh, I'm all over. Just type my name in and it'll send you to. Yeah, if you absolutely. Know my name, and it's Peter Herman Noon, not Moon. Thank you right, so much. Don't hang up just yet. We're going to take a picture with you in front of the TV screen with your face on it. We're going to walk over to that. Like Thomas Give us a second. Is, nice meeting you. Thomas is going to tell you when to smile.